Well, when it hits one, I'll finish finish my thought. But I think there's okay. an important backdrop to not only the legislative things, but everything that we're talking about here that right. we often forget. Yes. Well, uh, folks that are now looking forward to hopefully a very interactive, we encourage you guys to use the chat to ask questions. We'll give Q, it about Q another one. Yep. Q&A. Thank you very much. The uh, takes a village to deal with me. And I appreciate that. Angela, you've helped with that. Rosie, who always rocks, probably has the toughest job in the world. You know, she's going to probably uh, help lead me from, you know, administering the Q&A in the chat. Um, as it is one, one o'clock, we've got, you know, a bunch of wonderful guests on. I'd like to thank Angela Zakowski for all that she does on behalf of apartment owners and landlords across the state. You're an invaluable resource. And to me, what is A, a phenomenal way to help our communities by offering housing and B, a phenomenal way to provide for our families and build wealth. Most of you guys know this, but I'm Brian Armstrong, I'm CEO of Keller Williams Vermont, Strongwell Real Estate Team, as well as Strongwell Property Management. Real estate and everything residential rentals are some of my favorite professional topics. Uh, so today, I think we get some hot off the press legislative updates, and we're also going to talk about some ideas, tips, and tactics to help you maximize the value of your asset while also hopefully being a very responsible uh, housing provider. And we have uh, at least one uh, update or follow up from our last seminar, which was related to leasing um, applications and things of that nature. I have a little more information or some thoughts to share um, with folks on that as well. So we can save that for the end. Uh, so excellent. So Angela, I can't not stop thinking about, you said hot off the press. Hot. We just had meeting day. We saw changes in school tax funding. We had yeah. a you know, city had just cause prohibition on there. What's going on in Montpelier that affects us today? Yeah. So uh, for those who don't follow the legislative session, maybe as closely as, as I do, uh, Friday was what's called crossover day. Uh, and so what that means down at the legislature is uh, bills are supposed to move from one chamber to the other by that day, or they're not supposed to be allowed to move forward. I can tell you there's a lot of exceptions to that. That's not always the case, but um, it's the day where bills that the House are working on need to pass out of the House to go over to the Senate and sort of vice versa. Um, but it's always usually a good indicator of what are we looking at? What are the bills that are going to be moving this session? Um, and it gives us sort of a little more window, like what the legislative priorities are, right? Because up until now, lots of committees have been taking testimony on a variety of different bills. Um, and it's not always clear which ones are actually maybe going to move um, and be the priority. I will say that with a caveat that uh, it doesn't mean something couldn't get tacked on or we still don't have to keep an eye on some of these other bigger issues. But I think, you know, it gives us a little better roadmap. Um, so there's four bills right now related to housing. They're all pretty good sized bills um, that are looking at a bunch of different things. Uh, the first one is H629. Um, so H629 is really looking at a lot of the flooding situations. Um, it contains uh, flood disclosure requirements for real estate, sales, uh, for landlords, um, and for owners of mobile home parks. So uh, what this looks like it's going to be is a, a sim pretty simple disclosure by folks in those situations. The real estate one's a little bit, has a little bit more moving pieces. But for landlords and owners of mobile home parks, um, if your property is in a FEMA designated floodplain and is on the floodplain map, you are going to have to, if, assuming this bill goes forward, um, give a disclosure of that to your tenant at the time you're signing a lease. Um, and so the bill also tasks the Department of Housing and Community Development to generate and create a form for this. So it's going to be, you know, form. It's going to, you know, like the lead paint where we, we have the form. We all know what it looks like. Um, it's going to be something similar. Uh, and so it's really, it's just a disclosure bill. Uh, for landlords and property managers. 
Uh, the real estate sales piece is, like I said, has a little, a uh, few more moving pieces. And I know Peter Tucker and those guys are keeping an eye on this and have been in um, to talk about it. Um, it also has some other development related things um, related to accessibility standards. Uh, but again, that's for new projects. You know, it's for nothing existing. It's all sort of forward facing. Um, so that's that's 629. Uh, we have H829. Um, and this is a really large uh, appropriations bill. Uh, and so this is uh, appropriations to help create and generate uh, new rental units. Um, there, you know, this data that's being attached to this bill or supporting this bill is that the economics of it would support about 6,500 new units over the next 10 years. So a lot of this is uh, affordable housing related, affordable housing development. Um, and it looks like, you know, where it will impact people is that it looks like the revenue package for this uh, would be potentially an income tax surcharge and a property transfer tax increase. Uh, so already property transfer taxes, a part of that money goes into housing conservation fund, which is funds affordable housing. Um, so it sounds like there would be an increase to that and then perhaps a income tax surcharge uh, as well. Uh, so that's the um, sort of larger appropriations bill. Um, the other two that are sort of moving are really development style bills. So S311, uh, this is the massive Act 250 redesign, local permitting reforms, um, some housing program appropriations. So this is a bill that would have um, funding for rental assistance, rental arrearage assistance, um, and some other programs. Uh, also has some short-term rental uh, regulations in it. So it's sort of a big housing bill, but its main focus is on the you know, Act 250 and, and development. Um, and then we have uh, H687, uh, which is again, another permitting reform bill. So it's sort of the house's version of that, uh, which would be restructuring the natural resources board, um, the entity that handles Act 250 appeals and makes changes to Act 250 um, for forests and other sort of jurisdiction, some of the jurisdictional triggers for Act 250. Um, so a lot of focus on sort of the development side right now. Um, any of these bills could have any of those little weird housing bills I've been testifying on attached to them. Um, I've seen anything from should if a lease has uh, attorney's fees provision in it um, by statute, does that become reciprocal uh, towards the tenant as well? You know, I mean, which is kind of wild because there's so many statutes that give tenants attorney's fees if they have <laughs> a claim that they can prove against the landlord um, to adding uh, housing status as a protected class under fair housing uh, to uh, the just cause stuff has been real quiet. And so I don't know if I should be really nervous about that or if that's just indicative that it's they're not doing anything with it this year. So um, nothing happening with any of the just cause uh, charter anybody, bills. Anybody you think in particular our members should be talking with in Montpelier to advocate some of these bills going forward or in the case of just causes, assuming you share my viewpoint, that it's a great example of the road to hell is paved with good uh, good intentions. Uh, anybody in particular our members should be reaching out to and advocating? Um, I always best to reach out to your own elected official, right? The person that represents you in your district. Um, and I we did a seminar, was it the January one, where I had QR codes um, and there are, you can find who is your elected official. Um, those are the folks to reach out to. Those are the ones who are directly responsible to you um, as a constituent. Uh, and I think it's important for them to hear, even if they don't sit on a housing committee, they all talk to each other. And if folks who don't sit in housing start to get calls about housing, they reach out to the housing folks and are like, what are you guys doing? Like, why am I getting these calls from constituents? Like, what, 
what is going on over here. Um, and I think the big message and what I've been encouraging folks to do is, you know, tell, tell your stories, like, but focus on yourself. Don't focus on like, oh, my terrible tenant or, you know, just focus on the impact um, your tenant situations had with you. Focus on why rents have gone up, like what your costs are doing, how expensive it is to run rental property in the state of Vermont, um, you know, and that more regulations aren't really the answer. Um, mm -hmm. There, That's not going to solve. It's going to tighten the market even more. You know, you help actually with a segue that what I was thinking about before we started this and folks appreciate everybody showing up again, feel free to use the chat or Q&A for questions. Uh, and I'm going to have a lot of stream of consciousness today. Next time I'll try to do some more slides. But one of the things that dawned on me in a series of national and local challenges is David versus Goliath. You know, probably a lot of us have tenants that think we drive Bentleys, we have $250 million yachts in Lake Champlain, and they just think because we're the landlord, we're rolling it. Now, most landlords that I know started off like me, changing other people's toilets, you know, taking on as a part-time job, you know, banging on doors for rent at, you know, eight o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night, you know, working on the weekends, stuff like that. And I say that because the context that I feel we as a group of individuals have yet to successfully really drive home in Montpelier is that so many states that I'm aware of, even in just New Hampshire, and I think I mentioned this last time, you can complete an eviction in 30 days. Mm -hmm. I've got landlords who are friends, you know, in Florida, 30 days. I can see Angela and challenge me if you don't, but if you lived in a 30 day eviction state, having an elimination of just cause probably makes sense. Right. Right. And I think that's been the problem all along is that, you know, folks look at other states and, and they're not, the processes are not apples to apples. Um, our eviction process is very intricate. It's very um, technical and it is very long. Uh, and in so many places where just cause uh, legislation has passed and where those rules exist, their eviction process, i.e. the removal of a tenant from start to finish, is very fast. It's 30 days, sometimes, you know, 60 days. It's not a long process at all. And so, you know, when it's when the process when it goes that quickly, you would make sense. It would make sense that you would want to see, you know, a reason or landlord has to prove or a justification. Um, and we don't have that same system here. I I will say that, you know, we see that also with like with recovery residences, right? Because that is a form of housing, mm -hmm. um, and we can't get recovery residences up fast enough here in Vermont. And we know there's some entities in other states that would come and open up recovery residences here. They won't come here because of our landlord tenant laws. And they won't come here because that type of housing recovery residences is not exempt from landlord tenant statutes. And so, you know, if you have a home where people are in recovery and somebody needs to leave for whatever reason, because they're, you know, causing harm to the home or the occupants you have to go through a full-blown eviction with that person to have them removed or if they relapse or you know it so it it's a very our rules make it very challenging for a lot of the types of housing that we're trying to put in place here to help people um so you know i think I think some of that is starting to gain a little bit of traction down there, but the more it is said and the more folks hear it, the better. Absolutely. And folks always remember what Angela said, you know, talking about your challenges as a small business owner, as opposed to my evil tenant, because it becomes easy to be Goliath when we're better off to tactically be David. We did have a comment from an anonymous attendee and thank you very much. Are there any upcoming changes to Vermont eviction process in the legislature right now. Angela, my guess is it's really the legislature is going to have to deal with the towns that have passed just cause charter changes. So while I there mean, may not be a bill. Right. I mean, they can just sit on those. Like the legislature doesn't have to take those charter changes up. Um, they can just sit there. I think the the closest I've seen to sort of eviction overhaul or, or eviction bill um, is there, there was a bill that was working through that would have established 
a study committee to look at this issue. Does Vermont need to have its eviction statutes overhauled? Does do they need the process overhauled? Is there a better way to handle these types of cases? You know, is there do we need a housing court? Like so it was sort of this global um look like similar to what they did for act 250 right there was a giant task force that looked made recommendations some we've seen you know implemented some not so much but that same that's what i've seen oh. um and i think there's an acknowledgement that this is a big enough issue or question um and that sort of the piecemeal approach like a little bit here a little bit there maybe is not working right now for this particular type of um relationship excellent point well, we've probably got a lot of questions, but I know people are probably on here to also hear about maximizing rental, you know, income responsibility, because right. that's obviously- That's what was advertised. Why we do it. <laughs> so I encourage anybody to ask questions, to go through this. And Angela, with humor, you're great guardrails. So cut me off or mute me if I start to go a little outside. All right. So one of the things I encourage everybody to look at when they're looking at their leases and maximizing rental income and doing it responsibly is a few things. One, when I was a little bit more hands-on in our property management, and this is where, you know, Angela, you may mute me. I try to be equitable all and fair to all. But if I'm pushing, a, taking a chance with a tenant, not for any violation of fair housing, but maybe they have tough credit. One of the things I used to do is actually change or deal with the change of a lease. A lot of our leases were auto rolling and they were one year leases, then they go to month to month. So part of me maximizing my rental income was doing a risk analysis on the candidate and deciding, do I want that lease to go month to month, you know, or turn into month to month, or do I want it to actually end at a specific time? Because that'll help me realize, am I chasing the person that I gave, gave a chance to? or they paid on time or largely on time as they agreed to. So that will mitigate, not eliminate, some of my risks of having a longer term lease with a tenant who may or may not be able to you know, pay on a regular basis. Now, I'm really pleased. I, I'm please. gonna I'm gonna jump in here right now yeah. um, because there have been some changes and some developments legally related to the no cause notice that might wanna make mm -hmm. you rethink that approach. Um, Thank you. I'm so, I, unless you are very good at paperwork and you are very good at keeping track of deadlines and when leases are ending, I would never advise to have a lease that just ends. Because what happens is if you hit that date and you haven't signed a new lease or given your tenant a notice telling them they need to leave, you now have a situation where you have a tenant with no written lease. And so all mm -hmm. of your no cause notice timeframes have now extended 30 or 60 days longer. Um, you maybe don't have an attorney's fees provision anymore if you have to go to court. Um, it just, it creates a lot of chaos, legal chaos. Um, so what I would always recommend is if you have a lease for a year, you have very specific language that says at the end of this year, your lease is automatically going to transition to a month to month lease uh, because that means that lease is going to still be in effect if you miss a deadline or you don't get that renewal signed um, you know for folks that want to keep folks on a um, renewal uh, then do that but I the number of times I've seen things slide by and then you're the lease terms over you don't have clear language in there um, and it really creates this situation of, do we have a lease? Do we not have a lease? Are we able to enforce these clauses? Are we not able to enforce these clauses? It's um, it's not a really fun place to be. Um, so it goes beyond, I think, the just the um, no cause requirements. Um, I think, you know, there would legitimately be some arguments that if that lease expires and therefore it's not there anymore, um, attorney's fees provisions, like any other sort of financial obligations maybe go away. Like it just, it's a compounding problem. Absolutely. We'll get to the question we have in a second too. You know, the other thing that comes to mind too, and, and it, a lot of it is habits and models that we put in place. So I would encourage every landlord on here. Is it twice a year? Is it four times a year? Is it is it at least once a year? Put in your calendar to review not only your leases, but what are the market rents in the area? 
because I'm really proud. I'm thinking of two tenants that I think the world of two residents. I think the world, of, they've both been with us 20 years in different buildings. Promoted, they buy a house. They want to keep running. They're great, great people. One of them's, you know, gets subsidies. I'm really glad those subsidies are in place. And if we're like, if I'm like a lot of realtors in the past, I would go two, three, four years and then realize, wow, oh, these no. are great people, yeah. but I am massively under rent. My taxes have gone up. So the benefit of reviewing is it once a year, is it, you know, a couple times a year, how your units, you know, stack up can be a great way to slowly but surely keep your rents right. in the market. Right. The, the other thing ahead. that it does is what we're seeing right now is a lot of complaining down at the legislature about the drastic increase in rents that we've seen over the last couple of years in the state of Vermont. And part of that is because there was a two year period there from 2020 to about 2022 where landlords just were not raising the rents at all, mm -hmm. right? Because of COVID and restrictions and they just, they were baselined. And then what happened? So rents were baselined for a couple of years, or if you hadn't, were in line to increase rents and then skipped it. So maybe it's been three or four years and then operating costs just went through the roof. So a lot of the adjustments that I think that we have seen in the last two years are related to all of those issues. So instead of those incremental increases, it went from here to up here, and so it feels like to folks, it's landlords taking advantage of the market situation. And, and don't get me wrong, I am sure there is some people that have done that. Do I think the majority of landlords have done that? No. I think they had no rent increases for a number of years and then an unprecedented increase in operating expenses. And they had to adjust for that. Um, and I think that's exactly what's been happening with rent increases, but it's getting translated down in Montpelier to landlords are raising rents just because they can make more money. That's the message down there. Yeah. We have two questions or comments from, you know, from the lease. So let's go back just for a second. Sure. And Jan, you know, thank you for being here. I hope all is going well and don't hesitate to clarify this. Your uh, Jan's statement says, does that apply only to just cause instances? I may need some additional context that you may want to type in, Jan, to help us better answer that question. I'm assuming. Um, you know, I think I think that was related to the no cause conversation we were having about the end of the lease and the term expiring yeah. with no clear holdover clause. Um, and I think we sort of covered that um, if we didn't, you know, drop another question in the Q&A and we can we can readdress that. Mr. David Bean, what is the advantage of having a month to month lease versus a longer period? And is it situational? I mean, I, my opinion, I, Angela, yours. I think it's somewhat situational. And I think it also depends on what your model is for rentals. Um, there are some landlords that rent from June 1st to May 25th. That's their model. Like all leases go on that. Even if they're renting in January, that lease runs from January to May 25th. All their leases are on the same cycle. Um, some landlords only want to do month to month leases and they do month to month leases so they can ask the tenant to leave at any time with a no cause notice. Um, so, you know, I, you know, the, the advantage to a longer term lease is technically the tenant's supposed to be on the hook for that lease term if they break the lease. I think most of us know collecting it's challenging. And if a tenant's going to leave, they're going to leave no matter mm -hmm. whether they have a term lease or a month to month lease. Um, so it's, I, I think it's somewhat uh, situational and somewhat just what the landlord's business model is for how they're managing um, their renewals and their rentals. And Jan Battleline said you were correct, Angela. Okay. So, you know, my answer to that, David, is it is somewhat situational. First, make sure again you meet fair housing across the line the situational isn't to do anything that had violate fair housing but i would occasionally do it if i had somebody that was questionable references felt like they were a really good human being wanted to take a chance with them i would do shorter leases and not that it was any guarantee that i was going to be able to get them out but it made clear to them hey if you paid upon agree i'll gladly extend this but based upon your credit worthiness, the you know, reference you had from your last landlord, I have some concerns, so I'm going to do it a shorter period of time. Most of the time that I did a shorter period of time, I ended up extending because we got on a good habit with them. But I remember 
going to somebody at the fifth month because I was good on my paperwork and my dates and saying, hey, I told you we do a six month lease. If you paid on time, I'd expend. I've had to chase you four out of five months. I'm not renewing. And we were able to get them out smoothly and equitably. You know, so another comment about raising rents that come to mind is, and this is where if you put your email in the you know, chat, Rosie and I will send out an example of this letter. When I, I was thinking about those two wonderful residents I've had for 20 or more years and realized, I think one time they went three, four, five years without a lease increase. I first checked, there's a website I'll share in a second that HUD uses that you can dial in a zip code in a state and it'll give you what the section eight or HUD rents are in an area. They're usually pretty close to market, <laughs> you know, because obviously section eight the housing HUD wants to stay competitive. So I would issue a letter that would say, Angela, first and foremost, it's been a pleasure having you as a tenant. Per our records, the last time we raised your rent was blank. Now I do that so they know that, hey, it's been a long time since you raised my rent. Then I would say, based upon researching the market, we believe that two bedrooms like yours rent from X to Y dollars per month. You're currently at Z dollars. Based upon this and based upon how great of a tenant you have been, we are going to raise your rate, your rent effective. Now, blank date, now pause. You definitely want to double check, you know, that your lease, you want to double check the municipality you're in because how long they've been there, because that will change the answers depending upon, you know, Burlington has some different setup and so forth. Now, personally, if I had a resident that was going to have a big jump in rent, I would do one of two things. One, stagger it. Say, hey, going, starting at X date, we're going to raise it to maybe halfway to the market. And then in another six months or a year, so they feel that it's graduated. They also have a case of comparison. If they're paying $1,000 for a two-bedroom unit, that's $1,600 a month on the market. Most people realize they've got a good deal. They may not like the rents going up, but if it's not going up to $1,600, the landlord's being pretty fair. Okay. And the website, and I think I can put this in the chat, Rosie may be able to help me uh, with this, is... This is a great website to use all the time. Yep. It's right and, from HUD. And just um, for folks, I was just looking up for uh, the Chittenden County area, um, which is basically all towns in Chittenden County, some in Franklin um, and Grand Isle. So Chitt Burlington kind of swoops in all of those counties. Um, the fair market rents from HUD for a one bedroom is $1,441. A two bedroom is $1,887. Um, and that's for 2024. For 2023, the one bedroom was $1,238. So you can see HUD is adjusting those numbers as rents change here. Um, the three bedroom number for that is 2,390. So, you know, they're tracking those those rents and they're adjusting and making um, adjustments to what they will pay under vouchers and what they consider fair market rents. And so I know, I know we have some great real estate agents on this. I would recommend that you keep this website handy. And if you're working with buyers or sellers of investment properties and multifamilies, you encourage them to look at this site. Because one of the challenges seller clients have from time to time is they're significantly under rent and trying to sell a building based upon a capitalization rate, right. you know, to use projected to go with. So folks, I can't stress enough. First, I would use this HUD, HUD website. Secondly, I would do some of the non-obvious stuff. Check apartments.com, possibly Craigslist, see what you're finding in the areas, take a look at the pictures, how they're similar to your units, so that you're balancing, maximizing your investment, being a responsible and fair landlord, and that you have evidence that if you want to provide to your tenant that, hey, this is not just me trying to pay for my Bentley. This is, I don't have one for the record. Yeah, you know, this is me attempting to manage expenses and revenue responsibly. Yep. Other tactics, go ahead, and, please. And um, Vermont Housing Finance Agency also um, has a lot of this data as well uh, through the website housingdata.org. Um, but what they do is they pull the median rents uh, 
based on location around the state of Vermont. Uh, and so, you know, again, it's going to give you whatever that rent is right in the middle of the road. So, you know, depending on what amenities or if you include utilities, you know, your rent could potentially be higher or it could be lower. So that's another um, resource for just tracking to see are your rents in line with what everybody else is charging in your general area. You know, another great resource that's not the cheapest is the Allen and Brooks report that comes out. It's a study on uh, housing market in Chittenden County, rental units, so forth and so on. It's I think somewhere like three, four thousand dollars a report. So it's not the cheapest one, but if you know a real estate professional, property manager professional, they probably have access to that. That is absolutely a great source. Oh, a couple other thoughts that come to mind for me when I think about ma maximizing, you know, rental income from a property is you've got to balance a little bit of knowing your house, your property, excuse me, knowing, you know, what the condition is. And I would argue if you're going to keep a building over time and you're in a reasonably dis decent area, what improvements are you making such as possibly instead of carpet tile, you know, or pergo wood floors, they're going to make a unit a lot more attractive. It'll be a little bit more money up front, but a lot of that stuff, and I'm thinking, you know, wood flooring, actually is going to last further than carpet does as well. So I'd take a look at the improvements that you're making in your building to maximize the rent. You know, now, one of the things that I look at when I look at a building too, and this is an important piece, I'm under contract, knock on wood, to buy a 40 unit right now. And the, some of the units are significantly under rented. So to make it a worthwhile investment, I've got to get those rents to market. But I also have to do a zoom out to zoom in. Zoom out, what are the tenants used to paying? What is reasonable for the area? What is their economic ability to handle the increase? Because I wanna be respectful not only to the residents, but obviously to my business partners. And so I encourage anybody looking at raising their rents, take a look at the tenant themselves in an obviously fair housing compliant way and ask yourself, how are they gonna be able to handle the payment shock? And, you know, if they are in a position where they might be able to get some housing subsidies, and I said this on one show before, I one time bought a building, I'll say grandma, you know, sweet older woman, you know, was in a building paying 425 at the time, the market rent was for 700. I didn't want to just raise her rent three, $400. My mother raised me better than that. But by checking with Section 8, I realized we could raise her rent three, four hundred dollars a month and her rent only went up twenty five dollars. Right. So some of it's situational, like what what's Ooh. going on. And I think, you know, we have a question about what would be considered a large leap in rent. Um, I know a lot of folks uh, in this business deal more in percentages versus flat rates. I can I can tell you tenants and their advocates deal in flat rates. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the mm -hmm. examples that were thrown out were, is $100 a large leap? I don't consider that a large leap. The other one was 500. I would pause if I saw a rent increase that was $500. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably go back to the landlord and say, hey, did you have a big expense or was there some other, you know, what, what was going on here? Um, because I would, as an attorney, would want to see some sort of, support or justification for increase that large, even though it's not required Absolutely. under under law, um, that that number gave me pause 500 extra a month. Well, and great point. And talking about shock, if you've got a situation where, yes, you feel that it's time to bring it to market and it is going to be a payment shock for somebody, let's first see what type of potential housing assistance they may get. They may be somebody who doesn't want to be on assistance, you more power to them. But at the same time, they qualify. So maybe you can help them actually seek assistance. The other thing is, if it's just not going to work, you know, they're in an area that has exploded in a positive direction value wise, their means have stayed the same. Then I would encourage anybody who's looking at raising the rents, work, consider raising a little bit, but also working out an amicable exit strategy, mm -hmm. you know, because I think they'll appreciate it and say, hey, you know, future pacing, they can't just afford this. What could you do to help them find a reasonable exit strategy that will help treat them fairly, get them into a decent unit somewhere else, right. and allow you to you know, capitalize on current market rights? 
Right. And, and I think for me, that reaction is for the occupied unit. Um, if we're talking in between tenants and you're doing a wholesale review, I, I don't see a $500 increase from what the prior tenant was paying is an t- entirely different situation um, than I think in an occupied unit. Absolutely. The other thing I'd recommend too, whether you or your property manager, talk to the resident, see how they feel about it. What are their concerns about it? So you're not getting yes, that's just going to be an eviction a couple months down the line. Or you can show some empathy and again, work with them. So, but biggest thing I can recommend folks, make a habit. Is it once a year? Is it twice a year? I'd recommend twice a year at least. Analyze all your rental income as it compares to HUD, apartments.com, you know, Craigslist, stuff like that to balance being a great housing provider and maximizing the value of your asset. Right. And you could argue at some level when rents are, are not increased incrementally over time, you've actually done a disservice to that tenant, right? Because if yeah. a new owner comes in or something happens and the rents get adjusted, that's a giant shock versus it going up just a little bit every year and keeping you on pace to what the market is bearing. Um, that that creates even more chaos, I think. I think for tenants um, in that situation, when somebody new buys the building, if all the rents are under market, uh, then if the landlord had just kind of chipped away at that over time. Um, yeah. So last point, then I'll go actually utilities too, is again, if they don't know what the average market rent is area, they may not realize how kind you have been right. by not raising the rents over time. So the other thing that comes to mind when I think about maximizing rental income, I'm a big fan. I prefer units that the tenants pay their own utilities in. Now that does not mean don't buy a building, don't invest a building or go sell a building if the the utilities aren't separated. But a quick story, which I think Angela won't mute me on is I had two wonderful individuals that were with me a long time, but I went up in February, they had a fan blowing cigarette smoke out of the unit because of course I was paying the heat. And they weren't supposed to be smoking inside would be my guess. (laughs) <laughs> yep. And they weren't supposed to be smoking inside. So, you know, I you leveraged my mother's manners that she taught me. I was very polite to them. And I've never been so excited to have a furnace break. Mm. And I, it was what I'd call an old Freddy Krueger unit. One of those big giant units you find commonly in Burlington, Barry, Montpelier, 1930 house, whatever. And so if you've got a furnace that is aging on and it's shared utilities, Possibly some, I've heard some landlords even meter out water, which is a whole different topic. But I would look to any time you have to do a heating improvement. If you've got common, it's all serving multiple units, what could you do to separate the heating units? In the story that I just told, we actually were able to separate the units. Yes, they had a period of time that I paid for their heat on a new furnace. And then when they renewed, they were all of a sudden paying the heat. Now with humor, they called me up in the next winter and asked, is there insulation in this building? And I asked, <laughs> are you living like a Vermonter? Or are you or are you sitting in shorts, smoking cigarettes, blowing, you know, you know, blowing smoke out the window? So live like a Vermonter for a couple months. And if you got more challenges, call me back. We'll take a look at the insulation, Vermont gas. So separating utilities is a big one. Electric, it's not so much, but also important, but definitely heat whenever you can, my opinion is separate, you know, separate the heating units. Other things that come to mind that tenants or res- clients, the property management company and real estate clients often us as- underestimate is if you have garages. Now I would have to check in the municipal regulations of your town, but oftentimes with garages, like for my father, rest his soul, started to actually re- rent his unit at a reasonable rate and now in the building. And then said, hey, if you want the garage, it's a hundred extra dollars per month or 150. I also knew at another building that he owned, he actually rented the garages out. So if the tenants didn't rent them, he rented to somebody who might have an old car, who might have a thing. Now, the other suggestion that I have for our members today, and this is the case in the in the building knock on wood that I'm under contract on, is we had fire safety look at the look at the uh, one unit. And it was listed by the town as a two bedroom. It was rented by a two bedroom. It was, with the exception of lacking a smoke detector, more than ample space to be a three bedroom. 
So we're having improvements made that first and foremost meet fire and safety. Secondly, that we'll be able to have the town say, yes, this is a three bedroom now. So you may have units in your buildings that could be a two bedroom instead of one, a three instead of a two. Right. And, and I would encourage- And in Chittenden County, that rent just went from 1,800 a month to 2,300 a month for a three bedroom. Yeah. We're yeah. seeing in the unit that I'm thinking of, seeing a, you know probably a five or $600 raise. Now we're going to talk with a tenant, try to do everything I just said earlier, <laughs> see what we can do to help them, see what we can do to soft land it. And if it doesn't work, find an exit strategy that is equitable. So again, what can you do to separate utilities? Are you maximizing your you know square footage appropriately, not cramming people in like sardines, but being compliant with fire safety? Now, the other thing, and this is probably too you know, wide of a topic to cover, but Angela, you talked a lot about Act 250 changes, housing changes, density. I would encourage people who are looking, who are, you know, on this webinar to take a look at their units and see, depending upon the town, could you potentially add a unit to your, your property? Right. Right now, I've got a single family that I know based upon S100. I could easily probably add a second unit, if not a third and a fourth. Now, yes, it's going to take me a year or two to get it done. But those are otherwise to maximize your rents and again, bring value to a housing starved community. Correct. And I think that's um, part of the reason we're seeing a lot of these permitting changes and, and a lot of the changes are going to be for those town center areas, um, not sort of out in the rural areas. They're going to be for the places that have that municipal water, that have municipal sewer, that, you know, are there um, to, you know, create more density uh, in those uh downtown areas versus the sprawl out into the country, so to speak. Before I throw my next study again on rental increases, if they're receiving housing assistance, not only make sure you meet the necessary notices, but you might even call the housing assistant provider before you talk with a tenant. Hey, Mr. Okay. Mrs. Housing Authority, I understand Jane's at X. I saw in HUD, you know, that actually it's Y in the marketplace. How would this affect Jane if I rented this unit? Right. If I raise the rent. Yeah. yeah. And so that'll help a lot. Plus they'll at least know. And that way you can communicate to the tenant. Yes, your rent may be going to X hundred dollars, but your portion's only going to go up Y dollars. Right. And, and it also puts you in a situation where you don't um, send a rent increase and then have to walk it back because you shot over the top of whatever right. the rent amounts are that the housing authority will pay yeah. and section eight will pay. Um, so you just want to pay attention to that as well. Cause that's actually a worse situation for a landlord to, to have to backtrack on a rental increase because the rent was too high for what section eight would pay um, versus uh, getting it right sort of out of the gate. Yeah. And as a side note too, Angela made a great comment earlier, provide perspective. If you're doing one of those tenants letters to a long-term tenant and your taxes have gone up five grand in the last year you know, so forth and so on. Don't hesitate to mention that. So they, again, they don't see you as Goliath, just trying to pick a few more, a little bit more beat off the bone, but is really what we are, small business owners trying to provide for the community and the family. The other thing I suggest people take a look at, and this doesn't work so much in a one or two unit, but if you're operating four units, five units, six units, 10 units, coin ops can be a great way to provide value to your tenants because they know they don't have to go down the street to X, you know, um, and do their laundry. And it could be a great way to provide a little bit of additional income. I don't think they're massive money machines, but I can tell you in a couple buildings that I have coin ops on, they're good regular income and the tenants love having them on the spot. As a side note, certain local, uh, you know, laundry or excuse me, uh, appliance companies, I think Bouchard Pierce may be one of them, also has arrangements where they'll put them in your unit, they'll take care of them, they'll maintain them, and they will share the revenue with you. So yes, your water bill is going to go up, but I would bet, well, again, they're not massive money makers, they definitely make some extra money. And they're great magnets to keep tenants hmm. happy in, in the unit for a long period of time. Right. And, and I think, Along those same lines, what we're going to start to see as well are things like EV chargers or, you know, some of mm -hmm. these 
newer technologies related to vehicles people are starting to drive um, so those could also be good value adds there's different styles of those some that you pay for some that are just there um, so you know again there's i think some almost amenity like things that could be added that help bring value to a property absolutely and yana wallenberg thank you very much for sharing she just handed a great toolkit you know, for developers trying to add, you know, additional units. Um, Angela, what if anything comes to mind that, you know, some of the usual stuff that you've heard that I haven't shared today, anything that we've missed so far on how to maximize that come to mind from your perspective? No, I mean, I think the big thing is just keeping an eye on it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage annual renew reviews of, you know, what are my expenses? What, what big projects do I maybe have coming up? Like, is that furnace 30 years old? And am I going to have to replace that? And just, it's less jarring to your tenants if you are incrementally increasing over time versus keeping it stable, thinking they're doing them a favor and then have to do this huge jump in rent. Like that creates more conflict and more issues than if it had just slowly gone up over the course of four or five years. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. 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 Any let's see, question about rent increase, re-vetting tenants on their ability to pay rent. Angela, what are your thoughts? If I've got a long-term tenant and I've just raised the rent, you know, significantly, what are my rights, you know, to sort of re-vet this tenant? I mean, I, th I think you probably could, but the question becomes, you know, if you, if the rent's going to go up, either the tenant's going to pay it or they're, or they're not. Um, you know, if you're trying to figure out how to set that rent so the tenant could afford it, it would feels like you'd almost have to get that information before you started setting the rents. Um, but that, you know, that could be an approach is, you know, you know, you're going to have to do an increase. You give all the tenants a new application, just say, look, I need to get fresh income information. We're trying to do the rents, but we want to be fair and make sure people can still afford what we're doing. Um, you know, can you fill this out and send it back to us? That could be a potential option to kind of navigate that if you know you have a big increase coming. Um, the question is then, what do you do if you have a tenant that can't? Because um, mm -hmm. you're going to have to ask them to leave if that's the case. So you made another comment. If you send them the increased notice, but they do not qualify, would you have an option not to renew the lease? I mean, you always right. have the option to not renew the lease for any reason or no reason. And I know some of us manage smaller amounts of units, some of us larger, but whenever possible, I would encourage people to have these conversations in person, you know, for two reasons, you know, document what you do in writing, document what you do in writing to, you know, if you've got to call Angela, have that protected, but you can get a better sense of, are they saying yes, they're okay when they're not, or they can also hopefully sense your empathy. You're not just sending out that letter. So again, whenever possible, if it's, especially if it's a big one, go in a long-term tenant, go have the conversation in person. Right. Yeah. I you mean, know, there's nothing, there's nothing like having that person to person conversation. And I think that's what's missing with a lot of our communications with each other these days um, is we've lost that person to person piece and we forget there's a human on the other side of this conversation. You know, the other thing, we'll get to another question. Please keep the questions rolling. And I'm going to share, which is slightly off topic, but another property manager that I have a lot of respect for actually said, hey, that was a really good idea. You know, one of the things I encourage people managing their own properties or with their property managers is consider first and foremost, having any necessary account required by the municipality for your security deposits. Second, establish an operating account and ask yourself, what is the minimum that you want to have in that account at all times for emergencies? And then I'd encourage people, consider your own repair impact. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, I What I have in, in one uh, entity that owns properties is $500 a month goes automatically from one bank account to the next to build up an unanticipated repair the furnace that goes when you least need it, the roof that goes in the middle of the winter. So if you're, help, if you're using this income to live off of opposed to just reinvest, by doing this, you should hopefully have less significant surprises. Lo and behold, we were doing that. We built up a little over $11,000 issue. We actually ended up having a title issue from years ago, a Burlington lead program. Guess what? 
that rental impound or that self-imposed repair impound covered 90% of that surprise. So it doesn't mean it was surprises even more joy, you know, joyful. But if I was trying to pull monthly profits off that building, at least it wouldn't have tanked my ability. So again, have a security deposit, you know, and it may be several depending on the municipality that you operate in. Have an operating account that you establish a floor in and then do a self-imposed repair impound or escrow every single month so that you don't have big surprises that you can't afford or affect your ability if you're using the, the building for living. Right. But we had a question from Yana. Will you talk about vetting income on applications? Um, I mean, we can a little bit. I think that's a lot of what we talked about last time with the rental application seminar um, in, in February. Uh, but, you know, it can be, it's becoming harder and harder to uh, vet that information, you know, employers won't give information, but I think, you know, the important thing is you want to be collecting all sources of income. So, you know, a lot of folks just think income as like W-2 wages or sort of our traditional wages, um, but it, it can be anything, right? So it could be those wages, it could be self-employed, employment money, um, it could be that trust fund, depending on who your tenant pool is. Um, it could be government benefits. It could be that rental assistance. It could be, uh, you know, SNAP benefits or, you know, one of the other uh, social security, SSDI. Like there are so many sources of, of revenue um, and income for folks that the important thing is just to make sure you're asking for all of it and that you're not discounting something because it's not a traditional source of income um, for folks. And, and all of that counts if you have income guidelines or or other um, income rules for your properties. You know, it's one thing the mortgage industry of common looks for 28 to 33%, you know, of a person's income to go to principal interest tax and insurance. With certain automated underwritings, we even see up to 40%. You know, my personal two cents is somewhere around 35 or 40% is where we need to start being careful because will they have enough for groceries? Will they have enough for, you know, things? But um, the I other mean, thing is- Subsidized housing at- providers use 30%. So if a yeah. tenant is section eight or has some other sort of uh, housing subsidy, that tenant's paying no more than 30% of their income for their share of the rent. Um, but we see sort of higher percentages out in sort of the private market, 40, even 50% sometimes, you know, yeah. those start to make you feel a little, can they afford this? But that's, um, you know, those are sort of parameters. One of the thought, and we'll answer the question as well, and keep the questions uh, rolling, Yana, great to have you on, is whether it's a current resident that you're raising the rent on or whether it's a new applicant i would take a look at payment shock because even if it's below the 35 percent or 30 whatever number you use with humor if they're going out to dinner every night and eating steak and lobster that payment shock might sort of shock their system and their taste to the point so take a big look at rental shock and ask the question i know you're going from x to y how do you feel about that Mm -hmm. tell me more about that are you going to be able to make it? Yana had a question specifically uh, about foreign applicant with six months rent of cash, no income from U.S. as of yet. Cash income, can you reject the app if the cash income is coming from an unknown source, no tax churns, no cosigner? I'd say yes. I, but I I'd wrong. also be careful uh, because remember, uh, national origin is a protected class. Um, so you have to be careful that you're treat not treating somebody differently, um, because they aren't from here. Uh, so, you know, it just, as long as somebody from the U S who had a similar situation was treated the same way, like, so just, just because they're coming from another country with a different income stream or a different source of funding doesn't mean that it doesn't get counted. Um, so it's, those are challenging. Um, and we're seeing more and more, uh, international applicants and international folks coming in, uh, and then it can make vetting challenging for sure. I always get nervous if I get stacks of (laughs) twenties. 
folks, we've got a few minutes left. So if you've got any questions or, you know, we'd love to, you know, answer them, but in lieu of any additional questions, you know, one is for recap, from my perspective, first and foremost, make sure you're a member of the association, make sure you're talking to your local representatives and staying aware about the housing bills that are, you know, addressing the state. Secondly, please always consider self positioning as David, as opposed to Goliath. Make sure, as Angela said, they know your story, not your evil, you know, bad apple tenant, but how hard long you've owned the building, how you you know, did the work yourself, right. all that stuff. Or, or for instance, you know, you have a tenant leave, they created a lot of damage. That that unit took three months to repair and it was offline for three months, which means it wasn't available to somebody else for that time frame. And it and it took that long to get it back to the place where we could rent it again in decent condition, right? That's totally different approach than they destroyed the unit and it cost a lot of money to repair it. Absolutely. On rent increases, my recommendation, twice a year, review all your rents as it compares to market. And when you know you get a lease coming up, that's probably a good time to compare that specific unit. And Angela, you made a great point. Be the, you know, part of your point, raise them on a regular basis, not so you're squeezing every dime out so that they don't one day realize they're in a $1,600 a month market and they've been paying 950. Because that's not going to help them and it's not going to help you. I would also argue along the rental increases, document some other market examples, you know, let them know what the market is. And if it's a significant payment shock, one, ask, can they make it? Two is consider spreading that out over time so they know you're being reasonable and so forth. Other common things, separate utilities, especially heat, especially heat. Consider garages, coin ops. The other big thing I'd recommend now that I said it is set your home reserve requirement and have a self-imposed repair escrow that builds every single month. And right. folks, let's be frank. A lot of, I heard some ridiculous statistic and less than 50% of companies have three months reserves. COVID made three months feel like a drop in the bucket when it first came out. I'd recommend at least three, a gun to six, right. you know, or at least, you know, a number of 50 grand or something like that. If you own a lot of buildings, uh, so that when it happens, bad tenants, you know, multiple furnaces go down, that you're able to continue to provide great housing you're, and return profit. You're not having to liquidate your own personal um, uh, retirement account to pay your mortgage on your building because you have a tenant that's not paying rent. Like these are things that happen if you don't have these reserves. And if you've got business partners and they're not on today, bring this conversation up with them so that you can start to either A, agree upon some models and systems to run a more profitable building, or the other thing with humor, if you're thinking of buying or you have buildings that you don't have operating agreements, consider operating agreements between business partners. Now with humor, the only time the operating agreements used is when people aren't getting along. You know, That's actually probably true. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> But like, for example, the great people I'm partnering with in this building, we've got an operating agreement that spells out how many months reserves before we take draws. You know, a lot of little right. things that if we're not getting along, right. will guide us. Um, I'm going to post, I'm going to talk about one more thing before we log off here. For anybody who has an entity that they are doing business under. LLC, corporation, limited partnership, there is now a requirement that under the Federal Corporate Transparency Act that all beneficial owners of those entities have to be registered with the federal government. Um, if you just Google Corporate Transparency Act, that information will come up. Um, everybody's doing a terrible job of letting folks know uh, that they need to do this additional registration uh, with the federal government for existing entities you have till the end of this year, I believe, to get that paperwork in. Um, if you're newly formed, it's got to go at the time you're forming your your new entity. Uh, so just be aware of that. If you haven't heard about it or haven't done anything with it, uh, don't don't wait and don't ignore it. If I remember correctly, uh, there could be some pretty hefty fines, like somewhere in the second year or it's something like that. Federal, it's federal government, like, just, yeah, hefty fines. 
for just not doing paperwork. It's basically what it is. Yep. Three things put the fear of God in me. <laughs> the IRS or the federal government, state of Vermont, and my amazing wife. The, uh, you know, so folks, I can't stress enough. Hopefully you found value in today. Please feel free to reach out to Angela or myself if you have any questions. Also, if you have any additional topics, you know, we'd love to hear from you to keep bringing value. And stay tuned. I believe we'll get another one on the counter. We'll do in person again and try to get some what I call an accidental collaboration upon like minded professionals. Uh, but Angela, anything that comes to mind before we thank these people for their time? I don't th I don't think so. Uh, well, April uh, seminar is going to be on fair housing because April is fair housing month. Um, and then in May, we are bringing somebody in to talk to folks about solar panels, uh, house battery systems uh and ev chargers so love it yeah angela thanks for all you're doing on behalf of uh us apartment owners and operators everybody thanks for sharing your time today appreciate all that you do angela vermont apartment owners landlord association brian armstrong strong will property management kate of vermont strong will real estate team have a great day stay grateful and i hope you can go out and maximize your value by being a great community provider thank you brian thank you everyone take care